from Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, it's Continental Insurance Well, it's about time, Paul. I began to think you got yourself another board. Matter of fact, the company has taken on a couple of staff investigators. Why, the dirty so-and-so. But I managed to convince the press that you should handle this one. Which one? Protection for one of our clients, Johnny. His name is John R. Wilson. His life is being threatened. Oh, I get it. When there's a chance of somebody getting hurt, you don't want your own men to take any chances. Okay, I'll tell Randy Singer it's no go. Sergeant Randy Singer? Oh, he's a lieutenant now. 18th Precinct Homicide down in New York? That's right. Now, Singer has told us that if we send you down there, you'll cooperate. He sent anyone else? No. Hmm. And a, uh, another thing. What's that? There'll be a nice fee in addition to your expense account. You manage to keep this man Wilson alive. Oh, how much? $2,000. $3,000. $2,000, John. $2,000, John. Well? Well, it's been a long time since I've seen Randy Singer. Maybe I ought to run down there and say Hello. <laughs> in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yes, truly, Johnny Dalton. <laughs> and now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Insurance and Trust Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wayward killer matter. <laughs> Expense account item 1627, fare to New York and taxi from Grand Central Station to 18th Precinct Headquarters in East 40. My old pal, Sergeant Randy Singer, uh, Lieutenant Randy Singer, full of long face. Uh-oh, now I know my luck has run out. Hi, Randy. Well, what are you beefing about this time? Uh, you might as well sit down, I guess. Okay, okay sure. Well, if these insurance companies of yours leave us alone, let us handle things our own way. What do you mean? Uh, the minute one of their clients gets into a jam, they send somebody like you down to pester us. Johnny, there isn't a thing you can do about this man, Wilson. The company said something about his life being in danger. Yeah, yeah, that's what he said. Well, is it true? Uh, I doubt it. Why should his life be in danger? I don't think it should. Okay, okay. Why does he think his life is in danger? Because he was a witness to a shooting, a murder. Oh? Where? When? You remember reading about the bookie who was killed last week over in an alley off the of First Avenue? Mm-hmm. You know anything about bookies? Like All murder. right, now, did you read about it or didn't? Yeah, I read about it. Don't tell me a whole week is gone by and you haven't found a killer. We haven't found him. Even with a witness to the crime, this John Welton... Oh, Randy, you're slipping. Except for the description Mr. Welton gave us, we haven't a single solitary thing to go on. No fingerprints, no... No no clues of any kind. The weapon? 38 special, make unknown. The same one, apparently, that was used to slug Mr. Welton. Just what happened, Randy? Well, it was Tuesday night, Steve, last week, that is. Yeah? Late, about 2 a.m. Welton was taking his dog for a walk before going to bed. And? He passed this particular alley, saw these two men struggling. Heard a shot, so did his dog. Pooch let out a yelp, galloped around in circles, tied up his legs in the leash, and down he went. The dog or Welton? Welton, and don't be funny. Okay, go on. Then the killer came running out of the alley and stumbled over Welton. Welton got a good look at him in the street light. Dog pulled the hunk out of Achilles' pants. Achilles smashed Welton on the head and took off. The dog kept yowling until the patrolman came around and found him there and found the bookie in the alley. Dead. And? All I want to know is what you think you can do about it. No clues, huh? Except Welton's description. Did you give him a look at the mug book? Yeah, yeah, he came up with nothing. Did you find a gun? No, ballistic said it was a thirty-eight that did the job. Tried looking in the storm drains around there. Yeah, not yet. Look, why does Welton feel he's in danger? Because some fool reporter wrote it up in Sunday's paper that Welton not only saw the killer, you see, he'd been trying to keep that quiet, but that he could positively identify him. And when Welton tied that up with the fact that the victim was a book. Yeah, I see. That means the possibility of a connection with a syndicate. 
Or if he didn't play ball with the syndicate, they decided to knock him off. Well, now, Johnny, uh, we don't like to admit that there might be a syndicate in operation oh, anymore. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure, the town's absolutely clean. Well, now, oh, sure, I didn't say... Sure. All your handsome ways in uniform have to do is march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade, be uh, on hand to welcome important foreign dignitaries, yeah, uh, or snitch apples off the fruit stands over on 10th Avenue. Johnny... The fact remains that I think Welton's right. Bookmaking is a racket. Rackets mean racketeers. And as a mobster who killed that book, he was smart enough to leave you no clues. He's smart enough to shut the mouth of anybody who might be able to identify him permanently. Have you got a guard on Welton? Well, he's after one, and I've arranged for... Where does he live? Over on East 53rd. Uh, Tim Conroy, the man I'm going to send over there, just reported in. Then tell Conroy I'm going over there with him. But, Johnny, what for? What can you possibly do that we haven't done? Well, look, Randy, I'm getting such a nice, big, fat fee on this. I have to at least look like I'm earning it. Sure. Oh, oh, Conroy, come in, come in. Who knows, Randy? Maybe I'll even solve a murder. Conroy, get this wise guy <laughs> out of here, will you? Mr. Dollar, nice to see you again. Hi, Conroy. Yeah, your dear old pal Johnny Dollar. Now, take him with you. Take him anywhere, but get him out of here. Yes, sir. <laughs> You'll be sorry you're being nasty to me, Randy. Johnny, so help me. Yeah, it was pretty obvious Randy hadn't gotten anywhere on the case. And believe it or not, but he was glad I'd come along. But my job was solely to protect Mr. Welton. So in Conroy's trial car, we drove over to the little apartment building on East 53rd. Drove over to find a crowd milling about in front of the place. A crowd that included a couple of New York clients. Something's happened to you. Yeah. And I started to think what it might be. Wilson! McCarthy! Yeah. What's happening around here? You're a little late, Conroy. What's up? Well, don't you see him laying there? What? Who's wrong? Who is he, officer? Man named Welton. John R. Welton. <laughs> Johnny Dollar in a moment. Here is a message from the National Heart Institute of the Public Health Service. It looks like an electronic control board panel banked with meters and switches. It is knee high and six feet in length, surmounted by what appears to be a cylindrical coil. Its price is comparable to the cost of a new three bedroom home. But in human lives saved and repaired, its value is limitless. This is the heart lung machine. Its development has opened new latitudes in heart surgery. In closed heart surgery, with a finger or an instrument inside the beating heart, the surgeon must go by seal alone. This closed method has been in use for many years, and for some conditions it is still the method of choice. However, a great many heart conditions cannot be corrected by closed heart surgery. Only with the development of the heart-lung machine has correction of many of these conditions become possible. Today, the surgeon can open up the heart, empty it entirely of blood, and under direct vision, make unhurried repairs of valves or other defects inside the heart. Exactly what does the heart-lung machine do? Its purpose is to function temporarily as a heart pump and to oxygenate the blood and rid it of gaseous waste. In surgery, after the heart has been exposed, Plastic tubes from the heart-lung machine are inserted into the two great veins that normally carry blood to the heart from the upper and lower parts of the body. Once the hookup is complete, blood best and for the lungs is then cycled into the machine where it is refreshed and returned to the system through another tube inserted into the femoral artery in the groin. Know Your Heart was written and produced by the National Heart Institute one of the National Institutes of Health of the Public Health Service, United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, Washington, D.C. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Killer Matter. It looks as though I got there too late. The man for whom I was supposed to act as bodyguard lay sprawled awkwardly on the sidewalk in front of his apartment. 
Yeah, that's Mr. Wilson, all right. Johnny looks like you and your insurance company just lost a client. Hey, get this crowd back. He's still breathing. Come on, get him back. All right. You get a man out. Get back, all of you. Get back in the chair. Has anybody sent to a doctor? We got one on the way, Mr. Dollar. How did it happen, McCarthy? Do you know? Well, some kids were playing out here on the sidewalk. A couple of mothers with them. They heard a lot of noise up in Mr. Welton's apartment. Up there on the second floor. What kind of... You see up there where the windows broke out of the frame? Yeah, I see. What kind of noise? Like a big fight, they said. And Mr. Welton yelling for help. He was yelling bloody murder, they said. They hear anybody else? Anything else? No, sir. Not even the dog. You sure? Then all of a sudden, he comes smashing out through the window and lands here on the sidewalk. Have your men been inside there? Yes, yes sir. Wilson went in. Come on, get back. Stay back in that line, will you? He said Mr. Welton's place is an unholy mess, like a big fight. Any sign of the assailant? No, sir, but the door of his apartment was flung open. So was a back door leading into a court in the alley. Yes, sir, that's what Wilson told me. That's a fire door that can be opened only from the inside. So it looks like whoever did this to Welton made his getaway through the alley. No doubt about it. Well, all I have to say is I hope this man lives. We'll soon find out, sir. Here comes Doc Strader. <laughs> Trader made a quick inspection, then had us take Welton up to his apartment on the second floor. Fortunately, he wasn't hurt badly. No bones were broken. All right, all right, boy. All right, your mask is going to be okay. Just lay yourself down your pillow. Well, quite frankly, Mr. Dollar, I think that it's shock more than anything else. After all, thrown out of a window, even if he did suffer only a few bruises and confusion. Yeah, Doctor, I see what you mean. Down, boy. Down. <laughs> How long before I'll be able to talk to him? Well, the sedation I've given him should keep him asleep until... Uh, Oh, say mid-afternoon. After that, uh, well, you and your chief can question all you want. My chief? Aren't you working under Lieutenant Singer? Yeah. Maybe I am. Randy Singer himself came over and took charge. While John Welton slept, he and his men closed off the alley and went over with a fine tooth comb. Meanwhile, since Welton had all the police protection he could possibly need, and then some, I went out and grabbed a bite of lunch. That's Adam 2, 175. Then I took a cab, Adam 3, a dollar even, to the alley off First Avenue, where Welton had witnessed the murder the week before. Just why, I don't know. But I'm sure glad I did. Yeah. Because of a crew working on the streetlights who came up with some rather interesting information. I'll tell you what I mean later. In any event, it led to Adam 4 a dime for a phone call. You know, a fellow in my business has to have some rather strange contacts. My call was to one of them. To a man Lieutenant Randy Singer would have known by name, at least. Would probably have liked to get his hands on. Or, more to the point, would like to have had some concrete evidence against for, uh, well, for another thing. My contact's name was Smokey Joe Sullivan. Ex-counterfeiter, ex-bootlegger, burglary suspect, numbers racket. A man who's been picked up on more petty charges than you can possibly think of. Yeah. In a city with an underworld the size of New York, a man like Smokey's good to know. On occasion. Yeah. Smokey? Yeah. This is Johnny Dollar. Yeah. How would you like to pick up a fast hundred bucks? Depends. Johnny Dollar, huh? That's right. I'll be standing in the lobby of the hotel lecture. Come on over and see for yourself. Well? Maybe I will, maybe I won't. There's any coppers around here. Oh, come on, Smokey. You know me better than that. Yeah? I'll see you in the lobby of the lecture. Maybe. Item five, a dollar ten for taxi over to the lecture, where I waited. An hour, two hours. No sign of Smokey. Then suddenly I realized why. There must have been somebody important there in the hotel. For outside of the curb was a police car with a man in a uniform at the wheel. No wonder Smokey hadn't shown. I found it out to 3rd Avenue, started around the block. And sure enough, at the first newsstand, a figure that had been hiding behind a newspaper fell and stepped with me. What took you so long to spot that copper sitting out front, Johnny? Now look, Smokey, I asked you if you'd like to pick up a fast Cino. Depends, Johnny. I need some information. What kind of information, Johnny? You been taking any bets on the horses lately? Guy has to make an honest buck now and then. Have you been working through the syndicate? Now, Johnny, you know you don't ask questions like that. But if the information I want is in the books of the syndicate, you don't want me to play stoolie. You know me better than that. Okay. Ask me questions. Yeah. There's 20. 
way. You said it's he knows. You get the rest when you get the dope for me, if there's any to get. Okay. Go ahead. Ask me. All right. I want to know how much money, if any. I may be playing the wrong... I find out anything, sir. You call me on the phone again. Maybe 3.30, 4 o'clock. Sir. Right. And smoke you. Yeah? If there is such information to be had, and you get it, maybe I'll double that to you. Okay, Johnny. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Times have changed, and so has the man. Thaddeus Lowe, in the year 1861, organized what has been considered the first airborne reconnaissance unit of the United States Army. His craft? A balloon, which was in constant use during the Battle of Richmond, making observations every 15 minutes. But because of the balloon's limited maneuverability and extreme vulnerability, military thinking and interest soon switched to the heavier than aircraft experiments being conducted by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Finally, in 1909, the Army accepted the Wright brothers' 42 and one-half mile per hour aircraft. Contrast this with the faster-than-sound aircraft, the supersonic speeds of our modern planes. Contrast the skill, the technological know-how of the modern airman with that of the pioneers. You'll agree, I'm sure, that times have changed, and so has the man. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Killer Matter. Expense account item six ninety-five cents for a cab back to John R. Welton's apartment on East Fifty Third. Randy Singer's boys have found no clue to the identity of Welton's attacker. Welton himself is beginning to stir. Talk to him any minute now, Johnny. Okay, good. Oh, now, get down. Get down, boy. <laughs> Go lay on your pillow. No, uh, incidentally, we found the gun that was used in the murder he witnessed last week. Oh, where? Like you said, in the storm drain near that alley on First Avenue. Oh. Yeah, with no print. No print. Randy, I didn't think there would be. What time is it? Uh, 3.51. Why? Let me make a phone call. Oh, the phone's right over there. Hey, Wilton's coming too. Hey, well, what, what's this? What, what goes on here? Uh, it's all right, Mister Wilton. You're going to be okay. Uh, oh, uh, police. That's right. Yeah. Got a phone. Uh, thank you. I, I beg you. I. Yeah, I'm afraid we got uh, here a little too late, but you're going to be okay. The doc says so. That man, the man who attacked me. The same one you talked about the murder? Yes. Yes. Smokey, this is Johnny Dollar. Johnny. Dollar. Yeah? What? 23,400... 23... Yeah, I got it. Good boy. What? What did you say about... I'll meet you at the Lexus at 20... 6 p.m. And... Okay, okay, the newsstand. Mr. Dollar, what did you say about... about... The... Yeah, Johnny, what goes? Funny. How would you like to make an arrest? Arrest? That's right, Randy. Of the man who killed that bookie. When you... Got... You, you know who he is? Yeah, well, I sure do. And, Randy, I'm ashamed of you. What? Give him a point. Now, listen, Johnny, this will you... This really deserves the credit. Hmm? Good boy. Yeah. Now, down, down. Johnny, what under the sun are you talking about? The night of that murder. Welton says the pup chewed a hunk out of the killer's pants. Well, yes, yes, he, he was trying to defend me. You say that killer struck you, Welton. He did. But he made no move to hurt the dog. Well, now, believe me, that doesn't make sense. You would have put a bullet in him even before he struck you. Now, Mr. Dollar... What about this so-called fight here in your apartment a couple of hours ago? He was the same man. Yeah? And did the dog attempt to fight him off? No. Because there was nobody for him to fight. Johnny, you think he wouldn't have been heard down in the street if somebody really clobbered you? Well, he... You faked this attack on you, Welton, to make it look like the killer was somebody else. Too bad you didn't break your neck when you jumped out that window. Now, you don't know what you're talking about. Another thing... And this is where you missed the bet, Randy. Yeah? Over on First Avenue, I checked with a crew from the electric company. They finally got around to fixing that street light. Huh? Yeah. That light's been out for nearly three weeks. 
So how could Welton have seen another man in that alley well enough to make a positive identification? Now listen, Dollar. Shut up, Welton. Then my phone call just now. Randy, Welton was in hock to that bookie he murdered. To the tune of 23,000 bucks. He threatened me. He said he'd kill me if I didn't pay him. I had to kill him. If I hadn't killed him, he... <sighs> Breaks my heart, Johnny, but thanks. Okay, Welton, up on your feet. Item seven, sixty-five dollars even for a night in the town. Uh, Randy needed some relaxation. Item eight, two hundred bucks to Smokey Joe Sullivan. Expense account total, including a trip back to Hartford, three hundred fifteen dollars and seventeen cents. And uh, don't forget that two grand you promised me. After all, Welton's still alive for a while, at least. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Bailey originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Edgar Berrier, Herb Bygren, James McCallion, Paul Dubov, Lawrence Dobkin, John Daner, Bill James, and Vic Perrin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.